go on in here, but we will continue to record it. And it may be this afternoon, if it starts to kick and lag and spur and whatever, uh, when we finally do an upload, it does work. But I have learned over the past several weeks that at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, Facebook has started having major issues for about a month now. Actually, for about a year now. But the last four weeks have been really bad all over the country. So we do want to acknowledge that if you're joining us online, I apologize if the live feed doesn't quite go as smooth. But it is raining here in Evergreen, and when it rains at Evergreen, that means something's going to mess up. So we're just going to, and the internet normally is what it is. Uh, so we're excited that we can continue to worship. We'll have it as good, good and smooth as we can after it's all over. But we are glad that you're joining us. We have a QR code if you're online that you can click that, maybe know a little bit more about our church. Uh, also, if you're here, a guest with us, we welcome you and we're excited you've joined us. The stage is not always as such, but it is a weird Sunday. We have Thanksgiving, autumn, fall in the middle, and Christmas all around me. So I'm, it's one of those, I'm still getting over the turkey on Thursday. You know what I mean? I'm still kind of drowsy, but we just kind of work with what we work with and we're and we will kind of go with that. Oh, there, good, thank you. All right. Um, the announcements you'll find in your bulletin, there are the only event going on this, there are several going, things going on this afternoon. One o'clock, we will start pulling out from underneath the platform here, all the Christmas trees, all the decorations, start to decorate as much as we can, break down some of the things. If weather does provide a little respite, we will try to also go outside and put up some lights out there, but if it is muddy or still raining, we can bump that throughout the week and kind of work with that. But one o'clock, we get started. At six o'clock, uh, kids, preschool, choirs that are part of the Christmas play, we encourage you to be back up here, uh, get ready for that, and uh, then at 6.30, we have a run-through for the Christmas play. And I'm supposed to warn you, you were supposed to have your lines memorized, let me rephrase that, we are supposed to have our lines memorized, and I'm one of those guys that makes it up as I go along, like every Sunday morning. All right, so uh, we're going to see how it works. But we, no scripts on stage, Miss Sarah will throw something at you. That's what I understand. So that starts at 6 for the get ready, the kids with the costumes, and then 6.30, the rehearsal. Now, the youth will meet from 5 to 6, and they're going to be doing decorating down in their room, and they're having pizza. So if you feel like you're a teenager, even if you're 104, Cecil, they're having pizza. All right, so you can go down and get pizza. All right, kind of what they there. All right, each week, it is week one of the Advent. We want to uh, acknowledge the four great themes of Advent, hope, joy, hope, peace, love, and joy. So at this time, I'm going to invite uh, our candle lighters for the week to make their way down, and they're going to be lighting the first candle of our Advent wreath while we read. In a manger in Bethlehem, the Son of God was born into the world as the answer to their expectations. At the heart of Christmas is the hope that God has come to make all things right. Would you pray with me? God, you are the God of great hope. The promise is fulfilled through Jesus on that, on that eventful day that changed history forever. God, we recognize that at the heart of Christmas is not gifts. It is not trees or toys. It is not any of the, the trappings of the world. That the heart of Christmas is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is a message of hope. May we grasp that hope today. And all God's people said, amen. As our praise team makes their way down, I want to announce one last thing. In the lobby, and a few down here on the stage, are some devotionals called the Heart of Christmas. Each, starting on December 1st, their dates are numbered, but starting on December 1st, I would love for everyone in our church family to, we have 150 of these, or starting to get down, but 
Uh, take some of these, husband and wives, do it as a devotional together. Parents, do it with your family. I encourage not to let little kids take it. Uh, if we have some left at the, near the end of the season, but we want to make sure that the adults and the families and the singles and everybody else can kind of get these. Teens, I know you may want one on your own, but this is a great way for all of us to be on the heart of Christmas and on the same page as we look through this together. So as we do this, we are excited about the message of hope, and we're going to emphasize today. And one of the messages of hope is that we have Jesus Christ as our God, and we are here to do what? We are here to worship Him. So let's all stand as we sing, Come, now is the time to worship. to have a slew of kids here and did a baby dedication. We have one uh, that was not able to be with us last week, uh, schedules and everything else, but we are excited that we are able to have uh, Chris, uh, Christina and, and, and Andrew down here, and actually Tatum Joe is the star of the show. So uh, I believe I have a picture up there, Ed, on a PowerPoint. Can you kind of show that picture? There we go. Oh, that's not it. One more. Y'all come right over here because I've got the camera to get you right there. There we go. All right. Um, Sarah, can I get the mic? Good. Thank you, sir. We have a, a gift for you. It is a book on, obviously, the, the Bible, her first Bible, and then a prayer, a book, because I truly believe the power of a praying parent, this is one of the greatest things you can do for your kids, is to be praying for your kids. And to be honest with you, most people that have kids have already started to pray. All right. Uh, you know, Every time that they reach for something, every time they throw up one, and sometimes your prayers are just selfish prayers, okay? Lord, let me sleep tonight, okay? But that's all right. Here. I got Tatum Joe germs on my hanky, all right? You are, all right, I want to ask you a couple of questions. 
All right, first of all, where did the name, I want that back, yeah. <laughs> where did the name Tatum Joe come from? Tatum come from my sister Paris. Okay. And Joe came from her grandmother Paris. All right, so some family members and honoring them and such. As exact. Now, how is Tatum Joe, now how, what do you call her? Just Tatum? How is Tatum different than your first daughter? <laughs> you want to no, you can't eat it. <laughs> Tell me how she is smiling. You can't see it. How is she different than your first daughter? She's grabby. She's <laughs> ah, it is not an orange. She's a whole lot happier than uh, Willow. She's always smiling. Always smiling. Okay, you got the beautiful eyes. All right, and I know you don't have a, fra a favorite of the children because, but do they get? They seem to get along well. Every time I see them, they, they, uh, does uh, Willow love her baby sister? What, what is something Willow has done that's unique, that's kind of, that makes you think about when she's around Tatum? Well, she always thinks that she's her mama, so she says that's her baby. Mama's got you. Mama's got you. Christina, you have been replaced already, haven't you? Okay. So, uh, well, we are excited about this dedication. We also have some information and some other stuff for you, and I encourage you to grab that. And like I gave last week, you weren't here. But actually, it's a, a million-dollar chocolate bar because actually it's $1.29. I left the price tag on. But a uh, million dollars will never be enough to raise a kid, especially two. But we just want to kind of do that because I truly believe in giving chocolate because chocolate makes everything better. Now, we're going to say the vows. I don't believe I have them on the stage, but if you've got, you've got a copy in there. But if you would, if you've got your bulletin for those that are in here, all right, and, I, and I'll let you hold that because this is the vows that we're going to do. Uh, Ed, I don't think we... Oh, we do. They're going to be on the screen as well. So this is not just a dedication of Tatum and the parents. It's also as us that walk alongside the families, walk alongside the parents and say, look, you are part. And I hate to coin a phrase, but, you know, it takes a village. Sorry, did I say that out loud? Uh, but it does. We are all in this together. So would you stand in honor of the dedication of Tatum, but also the vows that we make to walk alongside them? All right. And so such as this. You can read off that or it'll be right on the screen up there as well. We acknowledge our children are gifts from God. Today, we dedicate them back to the Lord. We, acknowledge, we will be patient with her as the Lord is patient with us. We will teach her God's truths from the Bible as we also continue to learn. We will set a Christian example in our words, our attitudes, and our actions. We will encourage her to seek and follow the Lord all her days. We give her to the Lord for protection and for wisdom. Today and every day, she belongs to the Lord. Would you bow with me as we pray for Tatum and her parents? Lord, I just lift up Tatum that you would just let yourself be so real to her as she grows up. Let her know that the love of her parents is just wonderful, but the love of God just keeps everything together. So may her smiles be so true because she knows the love of Jesus all her life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, a rose with amethyst, uh, is that is her birth month, if I'm not mistaken, February? And it's not her birth month. All right, here, I'll give you this. Here, take you can have this. Oh, I give it, there you go. No, oh, well, you didn't want it. God bless. Thank you all. Let's continue in our singing. Uh, we have uh, the songs on the screen. Did I tell you all to sit down? Did I say sit down? No, stand up as we sing to the Lord.
seated. Thank you for worshiping in that song. Our kids, we do invite you. You are dismissed at this time. We are excited that we have that particular ministry for you. Uh, so we head on back there. It looks like Miss Catherine's got them already. And then I've got three volunteers, volunteers, whatever they might be. But i got three people that I've asked to come up. So would you all three come on up? Uh, each week, I'm going to have what I call a, a Sunday School Synergy moment, and I want to share with them a little bit. But before we do that, y'all go ahead and have a seat there, uh, any order you want. Let's watch this uh, th uh, theme introduction to the heart of...
personnel said, hey, we ought to have a representation from each of the schools. And then I said, sure, you can do it. He said, oh, I'm not here next week. So you can talk to Bert later, yeah. So we got, are you on? You don't think you're on? Is Black on? You will be having a conversation. Black is not working, so I don't know who that was. Uh, that, but we do have, from Rushford, we have, uh, check yours while you're at it. Just, just purple, purple, and they don't want to hear you, I guess. <laughs> Yo, share the yellow. Is it work? Can you talk into it? Make sure it works. Oh, uh, we got to be, got nothing. Are y'all hearing it? We're not coming through, here, I guess so. Oh, there, there's black, there you go, there's purple. And there you go. And orange, are you working? Am I working? You're working, okay. We're gonna put yellow right there at the manger, hoping that maybe Jesus will speak during this time. Uh, so from Rustburg, we have, you know, we have Brayley, and then from Cornerstone, we have Miss Cynthia, and then from Appomattox. Now, is there something about Appomattox that you wanna share, happen? Three more weeks till Christmas. Well, actually, I was thinking about the football game, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Moving right along. Um, Cynthia, we'll start with you because I know you're never at a loss of words. Uh, how have you been, I've got several questions. Some are about Sunday school, most are about the hope concept. How have you benefited from being in a small group study? I think getting to know people. Okay. Um, I'm very transparent, very realistic, people getting to know me. Oh, and we are health. getting to know you and your view of Paul. Well, um, everybody knew that already. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's it's nice to see the new people come in and just make a connection with them. Yeah, now, Brantley, you were you taught that class, and you have taught, and you will continue to teach some. But what is it about you about that class that has been a blessing? I just say the sense of community, um, and then there's a there's a, an accountability piece as well. Okay. Um, but I said sense of community. Yeah. And well, our, one of our newest members, but. Uh, I like getting the perspective from everybody. I mean, I think in a smaller group, people are more willing to share, more willing to talk. Okay. Uh, and you, everybody doesn't have to answer the next several questions. I'll just kind of, whoever speaks first, or I'll call on somebody. Do you think, let's move to our Christmas concept here. Do you think our culture has lost the true meaning of Christmas? Why or why not? I certainly hope it doesn't. Um, I know, at least my perspective, I think... Uh, you get your information from the most likely source, the media, and I think that's what the media likes to present. Um, I personally, at least in this community, uh, I don't get that perspective, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that's more common the rest of the country, uh, that it's not just isolated to here. It is, it is a little different here in Evergreen than, say, my son in Dallas or, or Fort Worth area. Um, the concept of hope is, brings up the concept that Jesus is the long-awaited Savior, and part of hoping is we have to wait. Now, Cynthia, you've been waiting for your child to figure out where is he going to be moving to and not moving to. Yes, but but do you have an announcement to make? I can't say that yet. Okay, he you have have an offer. don't say it out loud. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, why? What is? Why is it so hard to wait in life? Cynthia, can you answer that one? Why because is I'm, it so hard to wait? Because I'm a Woldridge at heart. Because you're a Woldridge at heart. <laughs> So do you get the lack, do you get the impatience from Cecil or from Linda? Oh, it's Cecil. <laughs> she didn't even have to hold the microphone. Everybody knew that answer. Uh, Brantley, why is it so hard to wait? I don't think we're taught how to wait. We're not taught how to wait. Yeah. Okay. Brantley, why is it so hard to wait in our life? That's what I was going to say. I just think from a young age, unless it's something you have learned coming up, you know, we want what we want. Yeah, um, and we want it now. And we want it now. Yeah. So we live in an instant gratification world. Um, why can't gifts, toys, and things bring lasting hope? I mean, there's nothing wrong with trees and, and penguins and owls or whatever, snowmen. But why can they not bring lasting hope? Brantley, we'll kind of go back the other way this time. Well, they, they don't last. Um, you know, they, they're going to go away. Yeah. Um, One of the things I do is I get a live Christmas tree. And obviously, I waited a week because I didn't want to have to throw it away by the 15th. So, uh, you know, because they do. It doesn't last. And how many of y'all even have the toys you got when you were kids? 
If you do, go to eBay. You can probably make lots of money. So, and I, I noticed your sister raised her hand and she has her, her toys from when she was a kid. My sister? Yes. She got all the toys. She got all the toys. <laughs> um, all right. Down to the end. How do you define, if we're talking about waiting and all this, how do you define hope? If you really want to define hope, you got three teenagers, and how do you define hope to them or to people that ask? Microphone. You know, it's funny to me when I saw this question, uh, one of the first things that came to mind was a phrase we had in my last career, which was hope is not a plan. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, I think hope and faith are, are linked very closely. Uh, you know, I think it goes back to some of the earlier questions, too, about uh, what is it we want in life and why do the, the gifts and the toys, uh, why are they so short-lived? And, you know, I think for me, hope uh, is that longer-term salvation, longer-term, where we're, where we're going to end up and, and what God wants for us, and, and I think yeah. that's what we need to keep. So it's almost like hope with the capital H, not the hope the world right. gives, but the hope that's eternal. Right. Cynthia, you got anything to add to that? How do you define hope? I think it's a promise that is given through Jesus. Okay, so you, you're bringing out the spiritual dimension that... The hope the world gives is going to fade away. It's going to be broken, uh, you know, crashed or whatever. But it's promised through Jesus. All right, so Brantley, um, how has God been faithful in your life? He's always been there. Um, despite my circumstances, the, despite my poor decisions, um, you know, every step of the way, he's always been there. So in spite of who we are, God still remains faithful. Cynthia, you got anything to add to that? How has God been faithful in your life, being a Woolridge? There's not a sofa long enough. <laughs> I mean, you can see his faithfulness through, through everything I've done, every stupid thing I've done. You see his faithfulness. So, uh, Cecil, did she do a lot of stupid things growing up? What stupid things? Did she do any stupid things growing up? Besides, let's go pre-Paul. <laughs> you got hope that I'll stop asking Please questions. Please stop asking questions. All right. Um, Les, how has God been faithful in your life? I mean, if you would have asked me 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago where I'd end up, I never would have said here. It never would have crossed my mind. And, you know, far be it for me to question it. I mean, it's things seem to be working out, and I have to have faith that they're going to keep doing so. God has a plan. It's amazing. He does greater than what we even hope or anticipate. And there is scripture around that. All right, one last, one round. Is there any last thoughts on the concept of hope? And it may just be a repeat of what you just said, but is there any last concept, any last thoughts that you want to share? Anything, let me just read it. Do you want to say anything to them before you all sit down? I just think it's trusting in a plan that's bigger than our own. Oh, powerful. Um, powerful. And we don't know what's going to happen, where we're going to be, but we have to trust in, trust in him. Okay. Just recognizing that it's there. Just the hope is there. And the promises are there. I was going to say, I mean, just uh, have the faith that the plan laid out is the plan for you, and, and it's going to happen. Yeah. And since y'all are parents of teenagers and young 20s, uh, this concept is we do live in a world of instant gratification, and, and we want things now. And as slow as things are around Evergreen, Appomattox, compared to the rest of the world, there still is that I want it now. But the hope of God is... To add the phrase, you know, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord, and he is faithful. He has been faithful, and he will continue to be faithful. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. You can uh, applaud them if you want. Sure. Yeah. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, B.J. Cecil Ed's class, and they've got some that will give different principles, but it'll be on the principles of, of peace. <clears throat> so and such as that. But I'm excited. If you got your Bibles, open up to Isaiah chapter 9. And speaking of hope, here is my son, okay, my grandson, the picture of the week. Uh, I ripped this from their TikTok. Uh, they have a farm, uh, her, his grandparents, his other grandparents have a farm, uh, and yesterday they had to actually do something very dangerous. Uh, they had to vaccinate, they raised bison, and they had to vaccinate the bison. And I was watching the drone vintage, uh, vintage and all this stuff. Man, it, those bisons, one, do not like to be isolated, and bisons do not like to be vaccinated. All right? They were, I mean, they were like jumping over up 10-foot high fence trying to get out. It was crazy. 
And here he is outside the gates there while they were doing all the work, just kind of smiling. So such as that. All right, thank you, Ed. Next slide there. Uh, and I want to talk about real briefly as I introduce this principle about a Christmas list. How many of y'all have made, whether you're a kid or an adult, doesn't matter, how many of y'all have made your Christmas wish list? All right. Now, I want you to know, I have normally done a Christmas wish list, but my first year here at Evergreen, I went to the lighting of the Christmas tree, and I talked to Santa, and I gave him my wish list. And I'm still waiting on it. I had only one thing on my wish list. I wanted a Chick-fil-A in Evergreen. I would even settle for Appomattox. All right? I'm still waiting. And maybe one day we'll get that. Maybe not. But we have a list of things to do. Uh, yesterday, Lisa and I went to Lynchburg with Alfred, and we did all these things and had all these you know, errands to run. And you make a list. You have a list of what you want to accomplish. And we have these whole principles of lists. And, and I do have a wish list. And my son has asked me, you know, he continues to give me his wish list. You know, he's 31, you know. Uh, and I'm not sure when, it, does it ever stop? I don't know, I don't, you know, but it doesn't. It just keeps going. So in this, we see what people long for, what people hope for. And often we see that what they have this year you're not even using next year. But in the days of Isaiah, in the days that he was writing about, in Isaiah chapter 9, he is getting to this great principle that the people of Israel had a wish list. They had a hope for something that was coming. Yet it was very difficult because many of them did not understand and they lived in this time of despair, this time of great depravity. The culture had, in itself was corrupt. The leaders were corrupt. And it seemed like that they were in this whole place of, of brokenness. And I really tried to grasp this, and, and I'm, I'm adding something that I wasn't planning on adding. But, but last night I had a dream. Now, this is not a Martin Luther King speech, okay? This is a, a literal... I had a dream. I woke up, and it was one of those dreams that was kind of creepy. Uh, if any of y'all... I, I dreamed I had died, and I was still on earth. I had died in the middle of a blizzard, a snow blizzard, being hit by a meteorite while driving a Ford that was out of control. Now, I'm not sure what all that says about me, all right? But the problem in my dream, it literally, I could go anywhere, but no one would see me. I would be around real people, and there was no interaction because I was dead. A few other people crossed my path, and they too had died. And we could talk, but they kind of went on their separate ways. And I literally, in my dream... And I, went, I woke up, and I went back to sleep, and I continued the dream. And that rarely happens, all right, in my life. I mean, because my, my brain is so ADD, and I'm everywhere. But this dream stuck through twice of being awake. And um, so I had this dream. And so I was talking to people, and I, was, and, and I wanted to talk to people. I, I longed for relationships. And there was one part of the dream where people that were alive started to see me. And they saw me in the shape that I was in, having been crumpled by a meteorite in the middle of a snowstorm with parts of a Ford still stuck in my legs and stuff. I mean, it was, I was grotesque. I was ugly. And to be fair, I was repulsive. Why did you laugh at that? Keep your wife in order, will you? <laughs> she laughed at so, but it was, and then when people saw me, they saw how ugly I was, and they actually walked away from me. And near the end of the third part of the dream, it was like I was dreaming in acts, uh, you know, different scenes, uh, I realized that what I was longing for was a light that I could walk into. Okay, now here's, you know, 
go and walk into the light. But I was longing for in excelsis. In, glory to God in the highest is what that phrase means. In excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. So I was longing for the in excelsis. I was longing for that from the highest to come down and shine a light and take me home and make all things right. Now, this sounds like I made this up, but literally, I dream this, and I don't know why. And normally, my dreams just pass, and I don't remember, but this thing stuck with me. And I started to go back to the Isaiah passage. I woke up, and I started looking at the sermon, and I started realizing, this is life. We are broken. We are ugly. We are literally dead spiritually. We are walking in this world, not in... Reality doesn't see us. I'm talking about without Christ here. And when people saw, if people could really see the real me, they would be repulsed. They would walk away. They would have nothing to do with me. And to be honest, if people saw the real you, your thoughts, your flaws, your mistakes, the stupid things you did as a kid, many would walk away from you too. And yet we long for relationships because even in Genesis, Adam was alone and, and God even said it is not good for a man to be alone. We were created to be in relationships. First and foremost with God, but also amongst ourselves. But yet we, we put on masks, we pretend to be something that we're not. We hide ourselves. We, we know the brokenness. We know the corruption. We know what's really inside, and we don't want people to see that. And we long for relationships, but yet when we try, relationships seems to just crumble, if not repel each other. And by the end of the dream, I literally didn't understand it, but I was longing, and I didn't catch this until after I woke up, but I was hoping for the light to take me out of the darkness. And I started to grasp that, you know, I'm not saying God gave me that dream. I probably ate some really bad turkey, all right? Um, I might have, you know, I... I don't know what it was, but I do believe God used the dream. I know a lot of it comes, if you've seen the new TV show on CBS called Ghost, okay, it's similar, some of the similar concepts, the way that you die, you're that way for all eternity, and I started thinking, I'm spiritually dead, I'm walking around this world a corpse, and yet, I don't really know reality, but I long for, and I hope for, for the light to take me out of this world. Now, I'm not talking about leaving the world. All right? I'm not talking about going to heaven, though that's ultimately my goal. What I'm talking about is I want to be taken out of the darkness. And in the book of Isaiah, the entire nation of Israel was in darkness. Like I said, the political leaders were corrupt. They had brought in idolatry. There had been military where, that had come in and defeated them and had basically pillaged them and all the stuff that was going on. And they were longing for a Savior. They were longing for a Deliverer. In Isaiah chapter 9, one of the most famous Old Testament passages connected to the birth of Christ, and to be honest, many didn't originally connect this to the birth of Christ. But in Isaiah chapter 9, I want to read a few verses. Pick up, if you would, in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, not just darkness, but deep darkness, on them the light has come. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us 
a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with the righteousness from, the time, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I mean, I read that and you automatically start hearing the carols that have been written from this passage. You automatically think about Jesus Christ. And to be fair, we're going to see in just a minute in the Gospels that they quote this passage specifically related that it is Jesus that's fulfilling the promise. But these people that were walking in darkness of that day, they also were longing for a deliverer right then. And yes, God did raise up. And, we, and from Isaiah 14 and other places we see, God did raise up a deliverer and God threw off the shackles of their oppressors from his people. But that freedom that they felt physically was only temporary because it wouldn't be long before they were back in shackles again. Just like the book of Judges, they cried out, we need a deliverer, and God would bring a deliverer, and then they would be delivered, but then they would sin, and they would rebel, and they'd go into idolatry again, so God would bring an oppressor, and they would go back into slavery, and then they would cry out, and God would bring a deliverer, and then they would, they would be delivered, and then they would, they would sin and mess up, and then they would go back into slavery again. The whole cycle of the book of Judges is that Delivery physically and nationally and politically in any other way that you find what you think is true freedom, true hope, those things are temporary. It will not last. Nations rise and nations fall. But God is on his throne forever. And we see the very aspect of this. Number one, there's three points I want you to point out. The presence of darkness threatens our hope. All right? They walked in darkness. It was tough. Yesterday I was out there, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, Chris and Chris Sams and some others were helping me put up the maypole. Or I was actually watching them put up the maypole. And uh, I got a little, you know, when you stab that owl, dude, that, that may have been the nightmare I got. I don't know where it came from. All right? Not a real owl, okay? But, uh, but you know, Chris Sams was actually, it's kind of interesting, he was a, uh, all of a sudden, a train passed by, and he just stopped and watched the train. And it kind of made me think about the way I do on Sunday mornings. You know, when a train passes by, I get distracted. We get distracted a lot. All right? Whether it's food before us, or problems before us, or, you know, Christmas lights and everything else. And, and in the time of darkness, the Israelites focused more upon the darkness than upon the hope of, Jesus, of their Messiah that would come. And you may be doing the same thing today. If you have not heard, Charles Garrett's daughter, uh, Christine, I believe, was diagnosed with leukemia. And I cannot imagine the darkness that they're going through as they're starting the treatment. And then there are others that are struggling with, with uh, cancer, our marriage and relationship issues. We have all these things, and don't get me wrong, the darkness is real. But it distracts us from the reality that God is faithful and that we can have hope. So the presence of darkness, it threatens our hope. And to be honest, the better way to say that, it threatens our attention on the hope. The hope is always there. But we get so distracted that we don't look at the hope and we live according to the darkness. How many people got so distraught over the election in 2016 or 2020 or 2022? Whether you like the turnout or not the turnout, there was always other people that were distraught. And to be honest with you, don't get me wrong, I voted and I think we should vote. And I think we should vote values and we should vote biblically. But whoever wins an election does not change my point of view that God has ever given up any of his authority. He is always on the throne. And if he is the God of hope, 
then I can always keep my eyes on the hope. So the second thing is, God's presence has come to give us hope. This manger, without the microphone, is a representation. In the devotional, there's a little crown, I think it's on the H, on the heart, but it is this concept, this manger, a very humble beginning, a very, uh, very destitute, very messy, very, I, I wouldn't lay my kid in here. And this was man-made. I mean, this one, this isn't one that even animals ate out of. But it's where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords laid his head. So I tried to find a picture of a, a you know, crown, and I've been asked by 17 people, which bar did I steal this from? Okay. But it, it wasn't. I actually ordered, I ordered it from the bar called Amazon. All right. <clears throat> but it is the principle that this is the heart of Christmas. It is the King of Kings. And if you can grasp that the Son of God came from through a virgin birth, then everything else in the Bible is easy to believe. If you can grasp this, then you can believe that he walked on water. If you can grasp this, then you can have hope to believe that he healed the sick, that he made the lame to walk and the blind to see. You can believe he raised people from the dead, and you can believe himself came back from the dead after he paid the penalty for our sin. This is why he came, and I have hope. And because he fulfills the promises of the Old Testament, we can believe in the promises that are yet still to come. He has been faithful. There is a plant. Remember, if I break into that, let me read you Matthew um, to let you know. So in Matthew, skip over if you would, Matthew chapter 1. We've got two passages, one in Matthew and one in Romans in just a second. But in Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read verses 22 and 23. It says this. All this took place, and he's talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. All this took place, Matthew 1, 22 and 23, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So if you think Isaiah 9 is referring to the offspring of Hezekiah, maybe, but what it's really referring to, because God says, okay, I'm going to clear it up right now. What Isaiah was talking about, because in verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And he's quoting Isaiah 14 here, which means God with us. So Joseph woke up from his dream, and he, he was broken. He didn't know what to do, but God had given him hope. Get out of Bethlehem, get down to Egypt, God will protect you. Okay? And he took his wife, and he took Mary, because he said, look, I don't understand it, but I have hope because God spoke. So from Isaiah, where God has given a promise, to Matthew, where God says, I'm fulfilling that promise in the birth of Christ. We have all of this coming together. Now, let me give you an example. And I'm not a, this is not really a farming example, but it is a horticulture example. Next slide, I have a picture of an agave americana, which to me sounds like a drink you'd get from jo Joe Beans. All right? But if you look at the bottom part of that plant, it looks kind of like a spider plant, or, uh, you know, I don't know what, you, it's, it's actually in Dallas. They recommended you put those plants outside your windows because they were that really hard, prickly type thing. And if, and if people tried to break in your windows, they'd be hurt from your plants. That's, why, that's how Dallas thinks about planting things, what will keep people out of your house. All right? But it is the agave americana, and it's also related to the century or the 100-year plant. And it lives, it thrives in arid, mountainous, desert-type settings. And it'll go years, sometimes 30 to 40 years, mostly 20 to 25 years, never blooming. All right? Never blooming. And then all of a sudden, with no warning, you don't know when it's going to start, but all of a sudden it'll sprout something. And that sprout you see here looks like a little tree in the middle of the plant. That's actually part of the plant, and it grows to a height of almost 20 to 40 feet and then blooms, and then it gets, you know, the bees come, and I mean, this is the middle of the desert, and for once, after 20 to 30 years, it sprouts this huge plant part, and blooms, and then the seed is spread out, and the next thing you know, the plant dies. That is a weird reproduction cycle. You don't know when it's going to happen, 
but you plant the plant hoping that it will last and hoping that one day it will reproduce itself. But you may wait, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, and this to me is a picture, of, this actually should be a Christmas tree. Because the Christmas tree is, they had no idea when it was going to happen. They had no idea this, what was really going to take place. But God tells us in Galatians, though, that when the time was right, when the cup was perfectly full, God at the right time, the appropriate time, he came to earth. And he came to bring life and then die. And by dying, he brings life. It's called the agave americana, but to be honest, it should be just the gospel. <laughs> Christmas comes once a year. We can plan on it. But we should never forget the hope that came and fulfilled the hope that those that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Let me give you one last point. It's this point. At the heart of Christmas is hope. If you got your Bibles, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 15, and I want to read one last passage. Okay, one last passage. Romans 15, 4 says this. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Isaiah, Malachi, Moses, all these things was written for our instructions. That through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have This devotional that I'm encouraging you to read doesn't take you, it does give you stories and stuff, but it always takes you back to Scripture. Because Scripture is where we find Jesus. And Jesus is where we find hope. As our praise team makes their way up, I'll give you one more story. Her name was Stella. This story came from a uh, James Dobson. Her name was Stella Thornhope. And it was her first Christmas alone. One of the reasons, and I, I've shared this publicly, I asked specifically uh, the Hopkins to light the candle because this is their first Christmas without their husband, without Roy, but it's not without hope. And what a symbolic picture that that represents. But Stella Thornhope, it was her first Christmas alone. Her husband had died of cancer just a few months prior, just a couple of months prior, and she decided, I don't want to decorate. She was going to funk. She depressed, dark times in her life. She had no hope. James Dobson writes, a few days before Christmas, her doorbell rang. And a little boy, and I kind of get this picture of someone kind of like Kendall, you know, kind of a rambunctious little redhead kind of showing up at the door and ringing the doorbell and said, and said, Merry Christmas, and says, I got a, a delivery for you. And the little boy gave a box to Stella. She opened the box, and inside the box was a puppy. Now, she didn't want a puppy. She didn't order a puppy. She didn't pay for a puppy. She goes, who sent this? And the little boy said, your husband. Months before your husband died, he talked to my parents, and my dog was having babies, having puppies. And he prepaid for a puppy. And the puppy is now six weeks old. It's been house trained, and it's ready for you. And he gave her a letter that was included. I don't know, can they be trained by six weeks? Whatever. Let's just go with the story, okay? It's a James Dobson story. Don't get mad at me. The letter said, look, I bought this months before I passed away. I knew you would be alone, so I planned ahead. I am providing for you, and I want you to know the faithfulness that I had in the past to you continues. And I pray that this dog gives you a hope for the future. She took the puppy and, they, and signed the papers, and the boy left, and she took the puppy down into the basement, and she started to unbox her Christmas decorations, and then she started to put up a Christmas tree, and she went, got the Christmas spirit back because of the puppy. It reminds me of what Jesus Christ, what God did through Jesus Christ at 
Bethlehem. He provided way in advance. He pays the price. He planned it out perfectly. It is a promise of hope that he gives. And he did it at the right time. And just like that puppy changed her life, he pushes back the darkness. The hope of Christmas is that. Those that walk in darkness have seen a great light. So I challenge you, and we're going to sing Angels We Have Heard on High. It's just a declaration. But are you going through some dark times right now? Do you need the light pushed back? The darkness pushed back by the light shining? Do you need to just lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, God, you have been faithful in the past, and you have planned and provided, and, and you have even purchased everything I need for the future. And I can have that hope. That's what Christmas reminds us of. And if you need that, I would love to just come down here and pray with you. I would love for just wherever you're at, give it to the Lord and just whatever it would be. Maybe you know someone in this room right now that's going through a dark time. And you need to just go over there and say, God's got you. Put your hand on their shoulder and say, God's got you. And you're not walking in this darkness alone. I'm with you. And the light is greater than the darkness. Maybe you feel this is the place God wants you to be involved in a church. We would love for you to be part of the shining light right here at Evergreen Baptist. But the first and most important thing you need to know is this. Do you know the hope of Jesus Christ? Don't leave today without that. Would you stand as we sing, Angels, we have heard on high. Yeah. 